Our next guest is Amit Dillon. He is the Managing Director for U.S. Africa Housing Finance. U.S. Africa Housing Finance is an American limited liability company that purchases home finance contracts and distributes interest to its investors. U.S. Africa Housing Finance has an exclusive agreement with American home builders of West Africa. Now, I had the chance to interview the co-founder and CFO for American Home Builders of West Africa, Robert Hernsby. If you have not listened to that interview, I urge you to go and listen to it because in that interview, Robert Hernsby laid out in details ways in which his firm is tackling the housing deficit in West Africa by building high-quality and affordable housing to members of the West Africa diaspora and to the regional West Africa market. Amit Dillon started his career as a software engineer at IBM. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from North Carolina State University and an MBA in Marketing from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Amit currently lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with his wife and two high school age boys. In this interview, Amit Dillon talks about how his firm US Africa Finance helps finance the homes it sells by qualifying buyers for a loan. The criteria his firm uses to determine the suitability of a borrower, the meaning of home finance contracts, and how one can become an investor in his firm. Amit is an approachable and friendly person. It was fun interviewing him. Here he is, the friendly Amit Dillon on the Barry Media Show. Good to have you on the Barry Media Show, Amit. Uh, yeah, fantastic to uh, to be here, Barry. Can you give us some background on uh, U.S. Africa housing finance and how you got into this business? Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. It's uh, actually quite uh, quite an interesting story. So, um, yeah, so <clears throat> basically, uh, first of all, I suppose I should give you a sense of what is U.S. Africa housing finance. Um, I think last uh, last episode you had uh, Robert Hornsby or Bob Hornsby on your uh, your show. So he has a company called American Home Builders of West Africa. And for those of you, you know, that haven't listened to that, I recommend listening to that podcast because uh, a lot of what I say will, will make a lot of sense if you hear that. So so Bob Hornsby um, has a company called American Home Builders of West Africa, and they basically market, sell, and build houses in uh, West Africa, of course, and. Uh, essentially, what I do is I help them with financing for their houses. So they build these houses, they find the end customers, uh, and then I go in and, and help them on the back end uh, with financing. So, so I should tell you that Bob Hornsby and I are, uh, are very close friends. So we, uh, we both went to business school together uh, at Wharton in Philadelphia together. And so essentially, I got involved in the business because I was an original investor in Bob's company back in 2014. You know, a couple of years later, uh, they were becoming quite successful uh, in the sense that, you know, there were a decent number of people that wanted to buy these homes. But the problem that American Home Builders was running into was uh, they didn't have financing. And, and so as you can imagine, the number of people, you know, they can just show up and pay for a house in cash, uh, you know, in, in Guinea, uh, even if they're in the diaspora, is relatively low. And, you know, these houses we're talking about you know, they sell from anywhere from twenty five, thirty thousand dollars all the way up to about two hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, with the average being about, let's say, eighty thousand uh, or so, you, uh, this is all U.S. dollars we're talking about. So, you can imagine if someone's going to buy an eighty or a hundred thousand dollar house, uh, the likelihood of them having that all in cash to pay isn't very high. I mean, there may be a few people here and there that that have it, but uh, by and large, most people don't. And so. Uh, it became abundantly clear uh, to Bob Hornsby and his, his partner in American Home Builders that 
unless there was an effective way to offer financing um, for these houses, there's no way that their business could scale. And so, uh, you know, since I was an investor in the company, uh, you know, one fine day they, they called me up and said, hey, I mean, you know, we, we've got this issue. I said, all right, guys, uh, this is Bob and Jonathan, the co-founders of American Homebuilders I'm talking to. I said, all right, guys, what's, what's the issue? And they said, well, you know, we've got plenty of demand for these houses, but we need to find some mechanism for finance. You know, long story short, there was really no bank uh, in, in anywhere in West Africa that was willing to offer you know, U.S. dollar loans to uh, somebody in the diaspora. So, you know, living in the U.S. or, or Western Europe to buy a house. So that wasn't going to work. And we thought about some U.S. banks, you know, what about Bank of America or, you know, Chase or whatever, you know, would, would they lend money to, to people living in the United States or in Europe for a house that they bought back in Africa? Answer again, no, sorry, not, not interested. Um, you know, we talked to a few NGOs, just, you know, quasi-government kind of organization, same thing. So really what it came down to is there was nobody that was willing to do this. So, so there's this old saying, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, so we decided, okay, then if, if nobody else is going to do this, no external entity is going to do it, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Uh, and that was the birth of U.S. Africa Housing Finance. So it was abundantly clear that the, the business was sound. And then the only real leap of faith, I guess you could say, that, that I, I took initially was, okay, if, you know, the business may be sound, but the, the people that are taking these loans out, how do we know that they are going to actually pay this back? Because that's obviously the biggest risk you're taking in, you know, as an investor in something like U.S. Uh, Africa Housing Finance. Uh, you know, the biggest risk is what's known as default risk, um, meaning you know, someone that you extend a loan to just doesn't pay you back. And there were a variety of things that we had put in place um, you know, when we established USHF from a, a, an underwriting perspective or you know, making sure that, that these were credit worthy um, borrowers. There were a variety of things that we had put in place um, that really made a lot of sense to me. Uh, and I talked to a bunch of, of, of friends of mine that are, that are bankers, some that are mortgage bankers, and, and they all sort of, uh, sort of backed up my thinking and saying, yeah, if you do those sorts of things, this, you know, the, the risk in this business gets decreased. So the, the, there are a couple of fundamental things that I think we do from a, a, an underwriting perspective. And, uh, again, you know, underwriting is just a fancy term for the verification of our, buyers, our borrowers rather to make sure that they will pay. Um, so there are a couple of unique things. Um, one, I think, and probably the biggest one is the fact that we require a 30% down payment, right? So, so let's just use a whole number, right? Let's say you're buying a hundred thousand dollar house. And again, everything that I mentioned during this whole thing, if I mention any monetary amount, it's all U S dollars because we only deal in U S dollars. There's no uh, local Guinean currency involved or any third, you know, Euro, nothing. It's all U S dollars, which is a, a key part of, of, of the investment here because there's no currency risk at all. Um, but, but getting back to the underwriting criteria, so let's use an example. Let's say that somebody um, you know, decided, they talked to American home builders, they found the plot that they want you know, there in, uh, in Guinea or now in, in Sierra Leone as well, just outside Freetown. And they said, okay, $100,000 for this house. You know, this is the model that I want. They make all that decision. They have to come up with $30,000, right? 30% 30 uh, as a down payment. And, and the reason why that's important is because when somebody has put 30% of their hard earned money in, the likelihood of them defaulting drops precipitously because they don't want to lose that 30%. And so, um, you know, that is probably the single biggest factor that gives me confidence that, that people are not going to default on their loan unless there's just some dire circumstance, right? They have some medical emergency and they just simply don't have the money. Um, you know, because you put that much down, people just don't uh, don't default. And so, <clears throat> one sort of key metric that I always uh, look at every quarter, and I'll give you the exact number for for the fund, uh, is what's known in the industry in, in the, the, the financing industry as LTV or loan to value, which simply put is just a ratio of the amount of money you have left on your loan divided by the original sale price. So, for example. That if we use that hundred thousand dollar example, if the person put thirty percent down, then that means that the outstanding amount for their loan is seventy thousand dollars. In other words, um, what they the, the sale price minus the thirty thousand. So seventy thousand divided by the original sale price would be a hundred thousand. So you have an LTV of uh, zero point seven or seventy percent, you might say. 
So everybody who takes a, a loan from us starts off with a 70% LTV, which is, of course, unheard of in the mortgage industry. You talk to any U.S. banker and you say, hey, you know, 70% LTV from day one. They're like, fantastic. You know, we never see that. But better than that is the average LTV across my entire portfolio at USAHF, and I have 33 loans right now in the portfolio, uh, the average LTV is 60.9%. So it's nearly 60%, let's just call it 60% for the sake of discussion. So when you have an average LTV, loan to value ratio across a portfolio of 33 loans at 60%, what that means is I could randomly pick any loan out of my portfolio and fully 40% of that loan has already been paid off. They've only got 60% of it to go. And in some cases, it's going to be even more. They've paid off 50%. And there's nobody that's paid less than, than 30% because that's the minimum requirement. So the reason why that's so significant is because if your number one concern, um, and this is what I tell investors in USAHF or potential investors, is if your number one concern about this investment is default, right? The, the borrower not paying the money. And that, by the way, should be your number one concern because that is by far the biggest risk you have. Uh, then the fact that each borrower has 40% skin in the game should make you sleep very well at night because you can bet your bottom dollar, no, no pun intended, that um, if somebody's put 40% of their hard earned money into this, that they're going to think 50 times before, before they default. And, and you know, the three year history has borne that out. We've had all of one default. If they, let's say, if they default on their loans, mm -hmm. do you take back the house right away? So, so the simple answer to your question is we do give them a grace period. It's the same standard you know, you'd find in the United States or uh, I suspect most uh, developed countries, which is um, 90 days. So you can essentially miss three payments. So once you miss the third payment, um, then we immediately initiate um, a, a default proceeding, essentially. Um, we retain the title to the house. As long as there is an outstanding amount of money due on that house, um, the, the borrower, the person who's occupying the house or owns the house, has the keys to the house, does not have the title. So if you were to go down to the, uh, the registry there, the, the uh, you know, Ministry of Housing in, in Conakry, and, and look at the various plots of land you know, uh, where our, our borrowers are, are living in those homes, and you looked at, to see who the owner was for, those, for the vast majority of them, it would say American Home Builders of West Africa, even though it's occupied by, by somebody who's got a loan and, and who's living there. It would still say that that house is owned by American Home Builders of West Africa, which is correct because it is technically still owned by American Home Builders of West Africa because the title is still in American Home Builders of West Africa's name. And that title is only given over to that person living in the house once they have paid off this, this, this loan uh, completely. Now, I, I explain all that as background because that's very, very significant. Uh, because in the case of a default, right after that, that grace period, since we retain the title, we have the legal right to that house. And we have, by the way, a legal contract that states all this. And that's a, a U.S. legal contract. It's not a, an African or a Guinean. It's a U.S. legal contract because I have to emphasize that all of our borrowers um, actually, let me say it the other way. None of our borrowers actually are uh, Guinean residents. They all live outside of Guinea. They're all from the diaspora, meaning they were either born there or they have relatives or they have an attachment to Guinea. Obviously, that's why they're buying a house. But they all live in what we refer to as OECD countries, um, which is just a uh, an organization of of the most developed countries in the world. So, uh, you know, when I say African or Guinean diaspora, think U.S., Germany. UK, France, Belgium, Sweden. Uh, these, these are countries that I just listed. I have borrowers uh, in my portfolio of 33 loans from every one of those countries that I, that I just mentioned, with the vast majority being in the United States. I mean, out of those 33, I haven't actually done the exact calculation, but easily you know, 22, 23 of them are in the US. And then the balance, you know, eight to 10 are uh, in Western Europe. And in fact, um, Barry, I'll, I'll make one other you know, quick point here. So our goal in this, um, and this is kind of an overarching theme, um, we, we don't want to see people default. We, we take no pleasure in, in anyone defaulting. So our goal is always 
to the extent that we can, you know, keeping in mind that this is a for-profit business that, you know, we're not a charity. Um, but our goal is always to try and keep people uh, in, in, the, in the house. Um, so, you know, if, if we can do things to help them in terms of, you know, deferring principal for a period of time or, um, you know, various different things, um, we will do that. Uh, because we, we want them to, to, to remain in the house. And, and you know, we're, we're in this business, you know, obviously to, to, to make a profit. But, but more than that, or equally to that, is, you know, I, I can speak for, for Jonathan and, and Bob, who are the co-founders of American Home Builders, and I can certainly speak for, for myself, Amit Dillon. I, one, of, one of many reasons why I'm involved in this is because I, I feel good. I feel good about the business. I feel good that, hey, look, we are servicing a need for people um, you know, the African diaspora who let's, let's be very, very, very honest. These are not, you know, wealthy people. These are people that have a dream, right? They left their, their birth country, you know, Guinea in this case, or Sierra Leone, or it might be Senegal. Um, and, you know, we're expanding other places in, in West Africa. They've left their home sometimes under tough circumstances, uh, you know, could be for asylum purposes or otherwise, um, to build a life in a foreign land. Right. United States, Germany, you know, UK, France, wherever it may be. And, and you know, many of them, they don't do, uh, you know, but but they work hard and and it feels good to me personally when I can do something that helps these folks. Um, and then when I went back to or when I went to Guinea for the first time, actually the only time, uh, you know, last November, um, I saw firsthand what's going on here. I mean, we actually spent the night uh, we rented back. Uh, one of the houses, a uh, gentleman who, who lives in Germany, actually, um, who has his house more or less as a vacation home. Uh, and it's a beautiful one. I think it's the most expensive house that we've sold. It's, I think, something around $200,000. Uh, we rented it back from him for a night. Bob and I spent the night there. Um, and I wanted to do that because I wanted to get a feel for, okay, what is it like to, to live in one of these houses? And what does the neighborhood look like? And what's it like when you get up in the morning and then, you know, walk around the, the, the neighborhood? Uh, and this is important to me because if I'm going to ask people to invest their hard-earned money into U.S. Africa housing finance, uh, then I have to be able to articulate to them, well, okay, what is the product that's being sold at the end of the day? You know, tell me these stories about what's going on. And obviously, I can't do that if I hadn't been there firsthand. And, and so, you know, when I spent time there, um, and I was there in Conakry for a whole week, uh, well, seven days um, last November, um, I really, really... Uh, I became even more passionate about U.S. Africa housing finance than I was prior to that because I saw firsthand uh, exactly the, the, you know, I'll call it the good that um, that this whole project is doing. And, and you know, I can I can get into details about it. You know, there's this whole term in the industry called impact and impact investing, and you know, we can we can talk about that. But you know, I, I really got a strong feeling um, of, of you know the the good that is coming out of this you know for profit venture. What type of corporate entity is U.S. Africa Housing Finance? So, so yeah, U.S. Africa Housing Finance is an American um, LLC, limited liability company. It's actually Delaware registered for, uh, for those that are, that are interested in knowing such things. Uh, it's a Delaware registered a limited liability company. Uh, so essentially what that means without go going into a deep business lesson, lesson is it's a partnership. And so uh, I am the managing director or the, sometimes referred to as the, the managing partner or managing member. Um, so I run it from a day-to-day -day perspective and I have the, uh, the freedom um, you know, to, to run it as I see fit. And then each one of my investors, uh, and I have, uh, I haven't counted the number recently, but it's on the order of uh, you know, 15, 16 uh, individual investors. Um, and I can talk a little bit about, about what they look like, but you know, let's say 15 or 16 um, investors, private investors, these are all private individuals. Um, and they are uh, what are called members or partners in uh, in USAHF. And so, uh, you know, all the returns that they get, all the profits that, that the various investors get, uh, that money uh, is all uh, flows down to their personal taxes, and they uh, uh, you know they pay tax on on their profits, um, you know, via their their personal account, as opposed to you know if you were a corporation and, and the corporate corporation was paying tax. You know these 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 fifteen investors have put in uh, one point five uh, million dollars in total, um, which you know, the, the math works out very very interestingly. There, it's about a hundred thousand dollars per person. Um, it, not everybody's invested that. There are obviously some that are invested much more than a hundred thousand, and and some 
um, quite a bit less. Uh, the minimum investment is 10,000. Um, but most of my investors, um, what, what I found is um, most investors tend to start small. So they might put in 10,000 or some will put 25,000 in. But then, you know, after a few months, they see that things are moving well. They'll put in another 25 and then another 25. You know, it'll go on and on. I've, I have one investor who's got well over 100,000 in. And I think he's invested in you know, four or five different times, four or five different chunks, uh, which, you know, bodes well for, for the investment because that basically means that people have faith and it, you know, they sort of put their their uh, you know toes in the water, so to speak, uh, and then once they realize, hey, this is you know this is a good good pool to be in, then they invest more, invest more, invest more. Uh, you know, not all, but a good percentage um, of of uh, my my investors in U.S. Africa housing finance uh, are immigrants themselves. Uh, you know, m many of them Indian uh, immigrants, uh, and and the reason why again I, I emphasize that that's significant is because. So if, if you yourself are an immigrant or your parents are, you know, and obviously you're very influenced by what your parents, uh, you know, will, will tell you growing up. Uh, and then someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, I, I've got this investment opportunity, um, you know, where you can earn. And, and I should mention, you know, it's about a 9% uh, annualized U.S. dollar return that, that people or my investors are getting. So it's not, not a bad investment. Right? It's, it's hard to get 9% uh, return on, on your money, you know, predictably. Um, but if someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, I've got this investment opportunity, you know, put in 10K, 25K, 100K, whatever it might be, and you'll earn 9% on your money and you don't have to do anything other than just you know, sit there and collect the, the dividend payments every quarter. Um, and, and by the way, the business involves helping immigrants to, to the U.S. or to Western Europe buy a house back in the country where, where they uh, you know, emigrated from. Um, that resonates with somebody who has an immigrant experience. Uh, certainly it resonated with me. That's arguably one of many reasons why I'm here running U.S. Africa Housing Finance is because I can appreciate what my borrowers are, are, are dealing with or, or, you know, emotionally what, what they, uh, uh, you know, why they want to, to purchase this house. Um, because again, I've never lived in India, but I've been back to India many times, you know, over my life. You know, over 10 times I've been back. I have cousins that live there. You know, I have a lot of, of course, um, you know, Indian friends and so forth. So, you know, I'm an American, I'm a U.S. citizen, I'm, you know, I love this country, but, um, you know, a, a part of me, um, you know, has this Indian heritage and, and, and is proud of it. And so I can very much appreciate why somebody coming from Guinea to the United States would want to buy a house back there. And so if I can help facilitate that, um, that makes me feel good. It's almost a dream for, for, for a, a Ghanaian or anybody from Africa to be able to come here and not have to deal with the, the pain and heartache of trying to project manage a house being built back in Guinea, you know, with their cousin or brother or friend or whatever. And I'm, I'm sure you, you have, you know, tons of stories about, you know, things going wrong with those kind of scenarios. So it's a dream for them to be able to deal with an American entity, pay their bill, you know, just the same way they would pay a U.S. mortgage, uh, you know, in dollars every month, and just know that they're going to get a quality home back in in Guinea. I mean, that's you know the the, the best case scenario for them. So so it's a long long winded way of saying uh, that I have uh, gotten a great response um, from an investor perspective from people that are immigrants themselves or you know are first generation, uh, and I think it's largely because they just they understand the uh, the dynamic. Um, and, and so each one of these are individuals. So I don't have any, any corporate or, or institutional investors. I would, would love to, to have some, some institutional investors. Yeah. So, so the current um, return, and I emphasize current because this is an investment. And, you know, given the whole COVID-19 situation that we're in, we know, invest, you know investments can go up, they can go down. Um, uh, but, but the track record, the last three years, um, it's been a 9% annual return. That's right. So, you know, someone puts in a hundred thousand uh, dollars by the end of the year, they, they now have $109,000. And uh, my largest investor has, has put in uh, $300,000, you know, one individual. Um, uh, so, so yeah, no, obviously I believe it's a, it's a great in investment. Um, but, you know, having said that, um, you know, one of the, the questions you, you, you'd probably ask me, or I think your listeners are probably thinking uh, is, but wait a minute, this is, this is Africa we're talking about. Isn't this phenomenally risky? Um, you know, sure, 9% sounds great. And okay, it's great that it's all US dollars, so I'm not dealing with currency risk or anything like that. 
but this is Africa, right? Crazy things happen in Africa, you know, coups and this and that and the other. And, you know, what if something crazy happens in Guinea or Sierra Leone or the other countries you're in and, um, you know, I lose all my money? Well, it, it turns out that, that you know, Africa doesn't operate that way, and, and really the world doesn't doesn't operate that way. Um, you know, countries don't just go away. Sure, you know, countries have have issues. Uh, you know, United States included, or you know, Western Europe, you know, developed countries included. COVID nineteen is a great example, right? Any country can be affected by anything, but but at the end of the day, particularly if you're investing in real estate and in housing real estate, you know, a solid asset. Even, even under a, a dire circumstance like a pandemic or those sorts of things, those assets don't go away. They're still there and, and they still retain value. Um, and, and that's sort of the key thing that I try and tell investors is that, yes, this, the house may be in West Africa, but you know what? It almost doesn't matter whether it's in West Africa or West Oakland or you know, the Western part of New York or you know, wherever it might be, because you know, bad things can happen anywhere. Um, but as long as you have a solid asset that's backing up the loan and that asset um, you know, is going to retain its value to some extent, um, th then, then you worry less about the, the, the local you know, political or, or uh, you know, geographic risk. You really come back to the biggest risk that you want to concern yourself with is default risk. You know, you're, you're originally in Guinea. And so, so let's just say you, you had a house, you know, one of our houses back in Conakry, and you had a loan from me, right? And you've, you know, 40% of it's paid off, uh, which is a typical scenario of one of my borrowers. And let's say something bad were to happen there, right? Ebola, well, we've already had that experience. Uh, or or you know, let's say a coup. I mean, God forbid, obviously we don't want this to happen, but, but let's say some sort of coup or, or natural disaster, or something happens, right? These things can happen. You're not suddenly going to just give up on Guinea and say, well, you know what? Ebola struck Guinea or there was a coup in Guinea. So you know what? I don't want to have anything to do with Guinea anymore. And that house that I you know, put 40% of my hard money into, you know, forget it. I don't care about that anymore. Let it go. You're not going to do that. You don't just give up on a, on, on a country, particularly a country that you have family in or friends or you were born there. You went to school. There. You, you, you don't give up. It's like family, right? Your, your family can do uh, you know, families, members do bad things all the time, but typically you don't just give up on them, right? You try and rehabilitate them or, you know, you, you, you forgive them. So it's a similar sort of thing. You know, the, 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 the person who's put their 40% hard earned money already into a house in Guinea, even if something bad happens in the country, they don't just give up, right? They, they, they say, okay, fine. We have to hunker down and I'm going to continue to pay for this house because I know this Ebola uh, epidemic, you know, we'll get to the other side, or I know if we have a, a short-term disruption because of a coup or strikes or whatever, you know, six months, a year, 18 months, two years, it, it'll clear up and, and we'll be back to, to normal. Um, and I don't want to lose that house in the interim. So people are going to hang on, um, you know, as, as, as long as they, they can, they don't just give up that, that easily when these things happen. And, and the reason why that's important is because if you understand that, and, and I realize that, you know, those who haven't been to Africa or haven't studied you know, these sorts of things or, or thought about them, that's not intuitively obvious. But, but if, you, if you sit back and you think about it, um, th that's not the biggest risk that you're dealing with in an investment here. And in fact, I would argue that's, that risk is, is not even all that high. So do you work with other companies as well beyond American home builders? So at the moment, the answer to that's no. Um, and, and there's a very simple reason for it. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, um, you know, the, 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 the biggest issue here uh, is, is default. And um, one big factor in someone defaulting uh, would be if American home builders didn't deliver the house that they promised to deliver, right? So, so I'm of course extending a loan to somebody um, you know, for, for a house and I'm doing that reason for that because you know i've been talking a lot about default risk uh, as being the, the number one and, and you know maybe even the only risk in in ushf um, but but certainly by far the, the most significant risk uh, and and one aspect of that is um, you can envision a scenario where i extend a loan to somebody and i do that you know up front when the person signs the papers and says okay i want this house at that point that house has not even been built uh, and they certainly don't have the keys to it, and they've certainly never lived in it and, and you know, gotten a feel for the house. So 
I, you know, as, as somebody who's running USAHF, could be holding a loan that the house was never properly delivered to, to the borrower because let's say American home builders didn't, didn't do their job and didn't build the house right. Well, that uh, borrower then would, uh, you know, and I would do the same if I were them, is just would stop paying. Say, okay, American home builders never delivered me the house that they promised. And so I'm just not going to pay on this, this loan anymore. Um, and what do I do as you know, the manager of USAHF at that point? Um, I can't blame the, the borrower because, okay, they signed a contract for a house which was never delivered by the developer. So I have to then turn to American home builders and say, hey, come on, guys, what gives? I've extended this loan. We've done all the underwriting, but you guys you know, never delivered the house. Um, I then now have a problem with that developer. Now, I don't have that issue with American home builders because as we've talked about in great detail, it's run by a very, very close personal friend and, and classmate of mine from Wharton, you know, for over 20 years, I know they're going to deliver and they have, I have 33 port loans in my portfolio and they've delivered on every one. And I have no doubt, you know, the next 300 they will deliver on. Um, but I don't have that kind of relationship with any other developer. Um, you know, so, so I often get approached by, by folks that say, Hey, you know, I've, I'm doing development work in Liberia or Ghana or Nigeria, or, you know, pick your favorite country. Sometimes it's even in East Africa. Uh, which I know much less about. Um, and I would love to work with some of those. I, I'm not opposed to the, the concept of working with them, but there's another layer of complexity if I have to do that, because then I not only have to vet the, the borrowers, I have to vet the developer as well, because I don't know if that developer is going to deliver on, uh, on their promises. So um, that adds, you know, multiple more layers of, of complexity. Okay. So, what are the terms of the home finance contract? Yeah, so so these uh, uh, we we actually uh, the technical term we use is installment purchase agreements or IPAs, but it doesn't really matter. Um, these these loans or IPAs uh, or finance contracts. The, the typical term is um, a ten year uh, ten year payback period. Um, you of course then have a uh, amortization table over ten years, so you know what your monthly uh, principal plus interest payment is going to be. Uh, you know, they, they, of course, make monthly payments, uh, and that's just you know, a, a direct transfer into a U.S. bank account. Uh, this is not a borrower I'm talking about. And the interest rate is 12%, uh, and these are all U.S. dollars. Um, so it's a 12% annual interest rate. And, and you know, some folks that are, that are listening to this might say, well, wait a minute, 12% interest, that is crazy high. But you know what? It turns out that's actually not a high rate at all. Uh, I've talked to multiple uh, banks in, uh, on the continent. Uh, there's a a very specific bank, I, I won't mention their name, but, but they're in Ghana, I was having a conversation with them. They actually charge 13.5% interest. Um, and, and so despite the fact that 12% sounds high, if you talk to anybody uh, who knows anything about uh, US dollar banking in Africa, they'll tell you 12% is a phenomenally good rate. In fact, you know, we, we could arguably charge more, but again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, our we're trying to balance, you know, our, our desire for profit with, you know, wanting to do good things for, uh, uh, you know, for, for the for the diaspora and, and for the continent itself. So we, we've kind of settled on this number, which we think is, is very fair. So if a borrower doesn't get a loan from you, what are their other options to get um, a house built by American home builders? Yeah, you know, so the, their, their options are very slim. The really only option is to either come up with the cash themselves to pay for the whole thing, which, as I say, is, is uh, you know, not a very good option or find some sort of private person that will finance you. You know, hopefully you've got some rich friend or uncle or somebody that can front you the cash, which also is, is highly unlikely, um, which is really just my, you know, uh, almost joking way of saying they don't really have many other options. I, actually, let me go so far as to say they have no other option because we've explored it, right? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll step back for a second and I'll tell you, in, in some, some sense, U.S. Africa housing finance as an entity should not exist. Now, that's you know, curious to hear you know, a person who's a managing director of a profitable business tell you that his business should not exist. But again, I'm being very, very open with you. This business should not exist. And the reason it should not exist is because there should be some banks, you know, like EcoBank or, you know, various other, uh, you know, banks in, in Africa that should step up and just do this themselves. It's really their business to, to be had. Um, 
you know, I don't really expect an American bank to step up and do this. I mean, they could, but I don't expect Bank of America or Chase or anybody to do this because they don't really understand the African continent at all. But those banks that are in Africa, they understand this and, and they really should be uh, in this business. And frankly, governments in Africa should be encouraging them. And by encouraging that, that may mean injecting capital into them in order to extend these kinds of, of dollar loans to the diaspora to, to uh, you know, buy, buy houses back in, in, in Guinea or Sierra Leone or Cote d'Ivoire, whatever country you, you want to pick. It's in their best interest outcome in a great scenario. And, you know, if there's anybody out there that's listening on this podcast that runs a, a, a bank or has those folks that runs a bank and, you know, want to get into the business of lending U.S. dollars to uh, the African diaspora so they can buy houses back in Africa, which, of course, is a benefit to the continent, give me a call. For those podcast uh, you know, listeners out there, I would say to them, if you're in the African diaspora and you want to get a 9% U.S. dollar return on your money, and, and at the same time, you want to help the continent of Africa, and I can talk to you about how this helps the continent of Africa, I don't think there's a better place for you to put your money. I challenge you to find me a better place to put your money. There isn't one uh, that gives you the balance of a good 9% U.S. dollar return, as well as fantastic social impact on the continent. I challenge you to find me a better investment. Um, and I'm very transparent with folks. I can, you know, that they can look through, uh, you know, the, the, the history of the business. And I don't think anybody can come to the, to any conclusion other than this is really the place that they should be putting their money. So before we end this interview, is there anything else you want to say? You know, um, I, I think I've probably covered all the high points. Uh, I mean, I guess, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to leave your, uh, your listeners with just a couple of thoughts, um, which is, um, and, and almost an appeal uh, as well. So, so I would ask, you know, anybody that's, that's listening to this that has any affinity towards, it doesn't have to be just Guinea or Sierra Leone, you know, where we're currently operating, but anywhere in West Africa, right? You can be Nigerian, Ghana, you know, whatever you might be. Go to usafricahf.com. Take a look at what we're doing and get involved, right? And, and, and maybe it's not involved in, in, in the venture that I'm running, US Africa Housing Finance or American Home Builders. You know, maybe there's some other venture out there that, that's similar. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of another one, but there might be. Um, but, but take your hard earned money and invest in these kinds of ventures. And what I mean by these kinds of ventures are these kind of ventures that will, number one, make a profit for you. Because let's be very clear, what I'm offering here, this is not philanthropy, right? I'm not a charity, you know, and, and, and I'm not a, uh, I'm very clear with people, this is a for-profit business, right? We make money doing this and there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, you, you should want to invest in this kind of entity to make money. But the other reason, and, and depends on who you are, sometimes it's even a more powerful reason than the money you're making to invest in this is because you are helping the continent of Africa by making money. And, and let me give you a very, very um, poignant example of that, 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 that really hit me very hard. And, and that I think your listeners uh, you know, who've been to Africa or know anything about Africa will appreciate. So people often ask me, they say, okay, this is great. I mean, you're telling me that I'm gonna make 9% of my money. Okay, I like that. And now you keep telling me that there's going to be impact on, uh, you know, positive impact on the continent of Africa as a result of me making this 9%. Well, give me an example of that impact. And, and my response to them is, how long do you have? I mean, how many hours do you have for me to explain to you the impact? Because uh, I can sit here for two hours and explain to you all the ways that there's positive impact in Africa. So we're building houses in Africa, right? And, and even if you've never seen those, those housing developments, most people have a sense of what it takes to build housing. And, and you know, imagine an area where you're building 40, 50, 60 you know, plus houses in one, one subdivision. There's a lot of labor involved, right? There are electricians and plumbers and guys mixing cement and people laying bricks and trucks coming in and out. You know, there's a lot of people, um, you know, typically men, but not always, you know, can, can be women as well, um, you know, that, that are building these houses. Uh, and, and these folks need to eat, right, during the day. Sometimes it's very hot and they're working and, you know, they can't just stop their job and, and go, you know, off and get food. So, so what happens in these places is entrepreneurial women will, will come to, to the development site during the day and they'll have food that they're selling to the laborers, 
right? The, nobody told them to, to do this. They just saw this, right? They're, they're entrepreneurial. They, these women you know, must be living nearby. Say, oh, okay, there, there are these laborers here. It's hot. They probably need food and drink. So you know, let me put some food and drink together. I can guess what kind of food they, they like to eat. And let me go sell it to them and, and you know, make a business out of it. And, and so I, I saw this firsthand. Uh, and, and, you know, when I was in Guinea and I don't speak French, I couldn't talk to these women and say, hey, you know, what are you doing? But it was blatantly obvious what they were doing. Um, they were just making a business. And I have no idea what, what they're, they're doing with the profits from this business. But, but you know what? I think we all know what they're doing with the profits from their business. They're probably using it to, to pay for school fees for their kids or for, for medicine or, or, you know, some better infrastructure for themselves. In other words, they're taking this money and they're benefiting their personal family. And that is very powerful, right? So, so when I sit there and I see this and I say to myself, hey, I am running this business and I'm making money off of it. But you know what? At the same time, there are people on the continent of Africa who I don't know, who I can't even speak to because I don't speak French. But I know because I've seen it with my own eyes, they're benefiting from this. In that little way, the, 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 those, those women that are selling these, these, this food to these folks, they're benefiting. And then there are obviously the laborers themselves are benefiting. Our staff on the ground there is benefiting. All of this um, added up is to the benefit of, of the country of Guinea. And, and so when I go to bed at night, I feel great that I'm running a profitable business. Or if you're an investor in USHF, you should feel very good that you're investing your money and you're making your 9% return. But you know what? You should also go to bed at night feeling great that there are people back in Guinea or in West Africa that are benefiting because you're making money. How many investments do you know of that you can legitimately say that? That you can say, you know what, by me making this money off my investment, I'm also helping a bunch of other people uh, who, who I have some, some affinity towards because you know, they're, they're fellow Africans. There just aren't that many opportunities out there to make that kind of investment. So, so I would implore your, your listeners, anybody who's listening, uh, think about that, dig into what we're doing and understand why we're as passionate as we are and join us, right? D d d don't think of it as just, you know, joining for a business for profit purposes, but, but join a, almost a movement, right? I don't want to oversell it, but, but, you know, join us in, in, in what we're doing and, see how, uh, how how this is a different kind of business. It's a, a for-profit business that is doing some great things on the ground in Africa. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I could, you know, keep talking on that point for hours, but, but I think uh, everybody, <laughs> everybody gets the point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, thank you, Amit, for a great interview. Thank you for sharing all this great information. It's my, uh, my pleasure, Barry. This is uh, the way I want to get the message out to, uh, to folks and, I urge them, you know, go to usafricahf.com, get in touch with me, send me an email, text me, call me. I'll be happy to dive into any level of detail that anybody wants to get into. Thanks to my guest, Amit Dillon. Thanks to you for listening. Visit his website at www.usafricahf.com. The Barry Media Show takes you places that you have never imagined. You can find me on Instagram at Barry Medias and on Twitter at Barry Medias.